Hi, I'm Mark Quinette Crosby here at one of the area's most beloved treasures, the U.S. National Arboretum. This beautiful oasis sits on nearly 450 acres. You have 10 miles of scenic winding roads to explore. And each year, more than half a million people come to visit. The draw are the ornamental and landscape plants. And don't forget, the interpretive gardens and exhibits. We'll see more of this lush landmark during today's show. But first, welcome to Artico Art in Your Community. is about people who tell stories, sharing their experiences on stage. Take a look. Uh, so Story District grew out of an organization that was called Washington Storytellers Theater. And they were founded in 1991 to bring in storytellers from around the country for like eight shows a year. And then in 1997, they started something they called the Speakeasy. And it was a once a month open mic storytelling night. Um, it was second Tuesday of the month, and each story was seven minutes on a common theme. And that's really what Story District inherited. In 20, 2005, I took over, and I eventually changed the name to Story District, and we grew from there. And this was, I mean, nobody knew what storytelling was. I mean, everybody thought storytelling was for children. That's the only way people really thought about it. So it was a very new idea to do it for adults or with adults. Yeah. We're still doing this. Allison at even one point called and said, I heard about your face. <laughs> You're like, it's getting clear up, it's fine. I was determined to make this happen. Now there's cities across the world that have storytelling events, there's podcasts. Um, you know, I've, The Moth is really a well-known starting place for all this because they that was a show that actually started the same time ours did. Um, but they, you know, having the podcast being featured on This American Life. Um, so some of these radio shows and podcasts, I think, have really helped expand the storytelling. Um, and now, yeah, you can barely go to a major city and not find a storytelling night. Um, I think for us, though, we're still, we're still different in the sense that most of these, youth, they put up a mic and you can, sh it's an, it really is open mic still. And we're distinct in that you, we curate it so much and we coach so much. So the thing you need to know about me is that I hate confrontation. And by that I mean I, I hate confrontation. So all the, the, when we say storytelling, we, we only mean autobiographical. So every story is in the first person, it's true, it's personal. And um, that's just a genre that's really kind of blossomed in the last decade. So what we do is we really work with people to give it a shape, give it a narrative arc, really pay attention to the things that matter so it actually, you walk away, it's not, oh, so what, why did I listen to that? And um, but now we have you know, 30 shows a year at most of the best venues in the city versus just once a month at um, the, a dive bar. I mean, some people are just complete naturals and you know them when you meet them. They just draw you in, you wanna hear everything they say, it's really colorful and animated and you know that they're going somewhere with the story. They really take you to the place and you're like, I need to know what happens. Suddenly two things are beginning to dawn on me. And, and, and the first is that I'm on a date with Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> <laughs> My date is on a date with Christopher One of us is on a date with Christopher Hitchens. Every now and then we'll get a comedian that will come tell a story, but for the most part they're not even performers. So one of the skills is just to keep it tight and focused. Um, another is they don't say enough. So it's really to flesh it out and give it that detail and that color that we're looking for. Some stories are completely just funny, but a lot of stories are actually about really meaningful things in people's lives or difficult things. There have been a few, like, you know, s sexual violence type things that we've dealt with. Yeah, some people talk about loss, you know, um, or having be kicked out of being kicked out of their family because they came out. Disease, you know, mental illness. Um, yeah, some really challenging subjects. His face falls and his eyes sink. And I just know instinctively that he thought it'd be a lot prettier in real life. But 
but I think, no, I can save this. Like, we like each other for our personalities, for the joking. Like, I can still tread water. I can turn this around. We're too funny to fail. Many people tell me it was life-changing to be able to take a story, a life experience, turn it into something that can be shared to a group and then have people just respond and have it in, out in the universe. Um, but what I say when, I, when people ask me tips about how to tell a good story, there's a couple things. One is really be in the moment. Go to that moment in your own mind, paint that picture. We want to see it through your eyes as it's happening. We want it to unfold. So the best stories are a series of scenes. And there's dialogue and there's vivid imagery. Um, and the other is to really have a sense of where it's going. Just, you know, what does this mean? Why does this matter to you? Or you as the character in the story, what should we care about? You want us to be rooting for you. Oh my gosh, I mean, just the satisfaction of having an audience listen and laugh or just gasp or just be there, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's a black guy, he's older, he's wearing a blue uniform. He's holding a mop, so he works as a custodial technician at the school. And to add to this mystery, he's wearing a black pirate eye patch. But I don't know who this is. I start to walk toward him, and I notice he's kind of skinny, and I guess the one eye he has left is kind of big, but I don't have any idea who this is. I mean, I thought maybe he's on my mom's bowling team, or maybe he goes to my grandmother's church because I really don't know any one-eyed janitors. <laughs> but as I got close to him and I went in for the embrace, I realized exactly who it was. It was my dad. <laughs> yes, a man who I had never had a conversation with is the one-eyed janitor at my new job. <laughs> It's the first of its kind in the world, and it's nestled right here on these grounds. It's the National Bonsai and Penjing Museum. It's also a place where our next artist explores his passion. They call him the Bonsai Master. Dr. Joseph Gutierrez has been cultivating bonsai trees for decades. The art of bonsai is to create an ornamental tree or shrub. This is done by artificially preventing it from reaching normal size. The idea started in China, but was later perfected by the Japanese. Bonsai actually are, are not a specific kind of a tree. Uh, bonsai is more of a technique. It's how to keep a tree small and dwarfed uh, and uh, growing well in a pot. I've always been interested in, uh, in bonsai, watching them, looking at them. Uh, but uh, in 1969, just before I got out of the service, um, my mother's birthday was coming up and I bought her a book on chrysanthemums. And it had chrysanthemum instructions on how to grow chrysanthemums, but it also had some, it also had a section on making bonsai out of chrysanthemums. There's many ways of making them. Uh, my own preference is to collect an old tree. Uh, I don't have a uh, hundred years to live, I don't think. They're old, they're gnarled, they're twisted, and then we just add the, uh, the art of uh, putting wire on and trimming and pruning. So it's much better to start with a, with a tree that's collected that's probably 50 or 60, 75, maybe 100 years old, and prune it back and let it grow back out. It's a lot better that way. There are specialized tools for bonsai uh, that are specific to, uh, to the art, uh, special types of wire cutters, and specialized types of pruning uh, equipment. Depending on the age and, uh, and species and the size of the pot, uh, some are potted every year, some are potted every other year, some of the older trees are potted about every five years. They require a lot of patience and they require a lot of love, a lot of interest. Uh, you have to know uh, what the needs of different trees are. There are many different trees that are used for bonsai. Uh, azaleas will not like full sun for the most part. They prefer shade, uh, whereas pines and, uh, and junipers like full sun all day. Uh, they all like different types of soil. I'm working on a tree right now. It's a, it's a large old camellia and uh, it's been al allowed to grow out and now I'm wiring it and getting it back into shape. We have several collections here at the uh, Bonsai Museum. There's a Japanese collection, which was the original 
set of bonsai trees that were donated by Japan uh, during the 200th anniversary of the U.S. That was 1976. Uh, we also have a Chinese pavilion, we have an American pavilion, and we have a tropical greenhouse as well. All I can say is that it's, it's, been, a very, it's been a very relaxing and a very uh, rewarding hobby for me. You learn to be patient. And now from trimming trees to cutting hair, how misfortune can sometimes be the breeding ground for good fortune. A few years back, Eric Dixon had an awful experience at the barber shop, but here's how it paid off. Today, he's a cutting edge barber who's making heads turn. I've been a barber for nine years now. Once I got into the business and really understood the business, I grew a passion for it. I, mean, I like, I enjoy making people look good. I got started in the business in an unfortunate way. I went to go get my hair cut one day a long time ago, and I went to a barber shop that wasn't that clean, and my scalp got affected. And it, I formed boils all over my scalp from a, a germ called dissecting cellulitis. So that kind of like, you know, pushed me away from barber shops, and then I learned to cut my own hair instead. My nephews and my friends, and they know who they are. They definitely, are good friends because I used to really butcher the hair. So, but they allowed me to get the practice in that I need. I got better and better. I can catch on really fast, especially when it comes to art. So once I figure out the tools and how the tools work, I can make it happen. I always challenge myself like, oh, let me see if I can try, let me see if I can do it this way. Let me see if I can add this type of detail and this type of detail. The way I come up with designs, uh, normally people come in, they have an idea of what they want. And then overall, once they get the vibe and, you know, they get the experience from me and they see that, you know, I can actually freestyle. The most requested design is normally park designs, normally with zigzags, where uh, it'll probably be something that goes down the, the side of the hair. A lot of women now are basically been, are free with their hair, I know. The short look is, is definitely a, a thing now. And it looks good on a lot of women. And a lot of designs go, go really, really well with it, uh, with their style. You have mini style. You have the complete shortcut. And then you have some with the, the hair uh, curls on top, low on the sides. Some with the braids, locks. You know. And then you just correlate uh, a cut with it and with the design. It just is really, it's, it's edgy. It's, it's, it's you know, really artsy. I just won my sixth trophy, first place for uh, freaky freestyle abstract design. It was a local battle with the DMV Ellis Barbers. They also on YouTube. They they showcase a lot of barbers and stylists in the in the area, um, and they have monthly um, battles and competitions. So it gives us a chance to really come together as a community of barbers and stylists to basically mingle for people to know that there are really good barbers in this area. And it gives a platform to be great and put our work out there for you know for success. So the, the good thing with this career, I can actually take that and, and, and put art into someone's head. And I, that's what I enjoy most about it, you know, being able to create every day. So it keeps my job fresh and keeps it going. And, you know, I can just create different types of art styles. There's no need to sit around bored. There's plenty to do this spring. For you film buffs, mark your calendars for AFI Docs. Now in its 17th year, AFI Docs presents the year's best documentaries. The festival takes place around DC and at the AFI Silver Theater in downtown Silver Spring. One of the films is Ernie and Joe. It's the story of two police officers working with the mentally ill on the streets of San Antonio, Texas. Ernie and Joe is a buddy movie. It's about two guys who are among their, each other's best friends. They give each other unmitigated grief. They have really terrible senses of humor that amuse each other tremendously. Um, they inspire each other, and they're, they're gonna inspire us too, because what they do together is something that most of us can't do, which is they are in San Antonio, part of the police department, a special unit, that is helping the mentally ill on the streets of San Antonio get treatment and not jail. 
to recognize Caribbean Heritage Month, AFI Silver once again hosts the DC Caribbean Film Fest. It features films from nine countries. The festival runs June 6th through the 12th. Also on June 6th, you can toast former WHUT Evening Exchange host Kojo Namdi. This special event celebrates his show being on WAMU for 20 years. Culture Shock and the Baloo High School Marching Band will perform. It takes place at the Howard Theater. And the Jerusalem Fund presents the Voices of Palestine Summer Film Series. The screenings are free and open to the public. The series runs May 30th through June 19th. Earlier this year, Democrat Rashida Tlaib made history. She became the first Palestinian American to serve in Congress. She also became a social media darling when she wore this embroidered Palestinian robe or thobe to her swearing-in ceremony. It inspired legions of Palestinian Americans. Palestinian Tatri's embroidery can be traced back some 3,000 years. This folk art is typically passed from mother to daughter over a cup of tea. That was the case with Wafa Ghanem and her sisters. Today, Wafa teaches Tatri's needlework and preserves the history of this elegant art form. Tatri's is the Arabic word meaning embroidery. And Palestinian embroidery is specifically the cross stitch, which is utbat al-fallahi, which literally means uh, or translates to the Quaker stitch or a villager's stitch. This is the primary stitch used by Palestinian people. The traditions that we're maintaining today, the styles that we're maintaining today began in the 1800s. It's normally passed down between mother and daughter. Um, so there's definitely an intergenerational component. My mother learned it from her mother and grandmother. I, myself and my sisters learned from my mother. Um, now it's a little different. I mean, you might have men or boys passing it down in, within their families but traditionally it's between mother and daughter. Palestinian embroidery is traditionally worn on our garments. Sure, we have pillowcases and wall hangings and things like that, but primarily we produce embroidery to ornament our clothing. So there's an extensive amount of embroidery. If anyone's seen a thob, which is a traditional Palestinian dress, they'd know that there's a lot of stitches on that dress and it must not be just by the hand of one person. In that process, they produce garments collectively. Um, traditionally in Palestine, pre-1948, um, before the creation of Israel and before Palestinians were displaced from their home, homeland, um, young girls would begin their collections of embroidery to prepare for marriage, to prepare for various event, special events in their lives at a young age. And families would work together to create that, to create their wardrobe. There's a lot of different kinds of motifs, and I think that that's what makes it so exciting and such a creative, dynamic art form. Um, we have, for instance, a cypress tree motif uh, that we call, my mother's from Safad, Palestine, which is the northern district of Palestine. Um, and in Safad, they would call it the tree of life. So when I'm talking about a motif, I'm referring specifically to patterns that we ha that you see, images that you'll see in our embroidery. Um, so sometimes we do have just kind of geometric designs, maybe like a square or a triangle repeated again and again. That's a motif. Um, but we also have pictures in our motifs. We have basically like iconography in our motifs that communicate something more than just embroidery. It tells us a story. It gives, and, and this is really the premise of my work in Tittities and Tea, is to educate Palestinians, non-Palestinians, embroiderers, non-embroiderers, that our embroidery is a form of documentation. You'll also see certain dresses that carry the Palestinian flag. During the first intifada, Palestinians were, in Palestine, were outlawed from carrying the Palestinian flags. So they would get shot, they would get, you know, imprisoned. There was a threat to their life. So Palestinian women reacted to that and began to incorporate the Palestinian flag in their motifs on their thobes as a form of resistance. Today, what I'm going to be teaching is Birds of Palestine on 8 o'clock. Birds, we have a lot of different birds in our like motifs and in our patterns. We have doves and singing birds. 
It's most challenging for people in the class to embroider in the specific technique that our grandmothers did. It's a sp specific kind of method in stitching and moving the needle so that the back of the cloth stays clean. And I try to explain to my students why this endeavor is so important for them to get through this challenge, to work through this obstacle. Palestinian embroidery is normally worn on garments, so we want to keep it as light as possible. We want to keep the back clean because we don't wear lining in our clothing normally. It should be so clean that you should see the motif on the back as you would on the front. Embroidery really is a language for Palestinian women. It always has been. And in the diaspora, the, the, that language might have changed because we were talking more, less about our village experiences and more about our national experience or our experience of exile. Um, but it's still a language. And I feel that in this sort of corporate, capitalist, consumerist culture where we view embroidery as beautiful and something we want to own and not necessarily produce, that message and that storytelling has been lost. When Congresswoman Talib wore her thob to the, her swearing-in ceremony, that was a moment that all Palestinian women could connect to because we all want to wear our thob to the special occasions in our lives, to our weddings, to our graduations, to our celebrations, and ultimately I think that that was an important part of that experience for Palestinians around the country, is to see her be her Palestinian self. APO, the American Pops Orchestra, is breathing new life into the Great American Songbook. Since 2015, it's redefined the classics, making them fun, fresh, and funky. Like this recent APO tribute to the music of the legendary composer Jerry Herman, sung by Broadway musical and reality TV stars. Put on your Sunday clothes when you feel down and out. Sweat down the street and have your picture talk. Dress like a I saw a real need for the preservation of classic American popular music. Everything from George Gershwin to Aretha Franklin, Ella Fitzgerald to the music tonight of Jerry Herman. So we've got, there's, there's a huge swath of music out there that I feel like especially younger audiences aren't as familiar with and I saw the need to preserve it. The great thing about this orchestra is they're all the top-notch, top-level professional musicians and they can play any style. We play for the Hispanic Heritage Awards for PBS and then we'll go play 80s pop music and then we'll go play 1920s dance music at another event. We do everything and that's what makes my job exciting. I think that so many audience members hear the phrase the Great American Songbook and they automatically assume it's only people over 60 who like that music or know that music. And the thing that I love is when I can take music that's very old, maybe 100 years old, maybe 50 years old, maybe 150 years old, and I have great singers interpret it in new ways. Where are the healings Tonight we're at Arena Stage and we're performing a tribute to Jerry Herman. And Jerry Herman is probably one of the most important Broadway composers of all time. His music has, touches on so many styles, so many themes, it, it talks about so many social things that are still pressing today. So tonight we're doing that, we're featuring the comedian Kathy Najimy. We've got Paige Davis from TLC's Trading Spaces and from Broadway. We've got Tracy Lynn Oliveira, who's a, a tremendous talent who's been on Broadway and lives in DC. Mal Martinez, who was the lead in On Your Feet on Broadway. I recently uh, finished my run as Emilio Estefan in the Broadway musical On Your Feet that I starred in on Broadway and I took it on the road for a little bit over a year. So that was very exciting. It was my first Broadway show in America, in English. I'm from Mexico, Mexico. Um, I'm imported just like guacamole and tequila. I was touring with On Your Feet and I got an email from Luke Frazier. I said yes immediately when he said, um, who he was and I, I searched for his work and I fell in love with 
his arrangements and his music, his creativity. So we're bringing in top level billboard artists to come in and sing music that was written 100 years ago. And it keeps it fresh and it keeps it alive and it brings in new audiences. Well, that looked like fun, and I had a lot of fun hanging out with you in these lovely and serene surroundings. Well, that's our show for today, but until next time, I'm Anquanette Crosby, and always remember to follow your art. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.